Hey guys, this is Box, and I'm back kicking off with a ruling video. Today's video, we got three ruling questions, all covering different concepts that you should know for this current format. That's right, these are meta relevant rulings and the concepts themselves are more or less timeless. You're gonna be able to apply this from now to forever, hopefully. And so make sure you guys hit the like button, hit subscribe, and get a notification about one of these particular scenarios screwed over my friend because they didn't call a judge, they didn't have a judge at hand or something, and they played into an illegal game state. Whatever the case may be, uh, hopefully by the end of this, you guys don't get screwed over by this, and some of these will be future relevant, and a lot of it kind of has something to do with snake eyes, so, you know, the removal of pushing stuff to the back, we're gonna be talking about that, so here we go. Question number one, we're gonna start things simple, and we have Exchange, a classic Yugi card where you and your opponent basically trade cards. So in this scenario, player A opens a hand full of cards, a field spell, exchange, two bonfires, and imperm. Or rather than giving the opponent any chance to grab something useful, sets away most things except for the extra copy of bonfire and proceeds to activate the exchange. Both players reveal their hand and he decides to pluck one card out of the opponent's hand, which was a mirror match. He proceeds to take the opponent's snake eye poplar and then gives away the bonfire. You know, no biggie sees a bonfire in the opponent's hand anyway. And so, after this point, player A decides like, hey, I added a Snake Eyes Poplar into my hand. I'm gonna activate that Snake Eyes Poplar from my hand. Player because, hey, you didn't actually add the card to your hand. You can't activate the card because it, you, you didn't add it from your deck. You didn't add it from anywhere. You just took it from my hand. We traded cards. And so they call a judge. This one's very simple. We're just warming you up. So you guys have five seconds to answer this. Five, four, three, two, one. The answer is simple. Yes, you do get to activate the effect of Snake Eyes Poplar. It doesn't matter which version of the Cartex you have for exchange, all of them from the very first rendition from the Eternal Duelist Soul to like the Sacred Cards, whichever version it is, all of the mentions add a card from your opponent's hand to your hand. So because of the word add existing in there, you're not just taking the card and therefore the terminology matches the trigger, which is Snake Eyes Poplar. Poplar states that if this card is added to your hand except by drawing, you can special summon this card. That trigger does activate even if it is from your opponent's hand and you will be able to special summon it. Where did this question come from? Um, originally this was asked by uh, Shunping Zhu. He asked me to do this during the QCC. I'm like, yeah, you should technically be able to activate this. I just need to just check the wording on the card. And we even managed to ask the head judge at the time about this. It's like, yeah, it should be able to activate based off of the wording. It does meet the trigger condition. So that was kind of fun. So based off of that, why does this even matter? Why are people playing exchange? Well, the theory behind exchange, if we're going to go step away from ruling for a second, the theory behind exchange is that you would trade away one of your starters, such as something like bonfire, something you have extras of that you can activate later on. You would trade away one of your starters to get a clear pathway to play around your opponent's hand jump. If you have like stuff like cross out designator in your hand already, you will preemptively play it against one of the worst hitting hand traps, say like an imperm or a nib, and then you play exchange to give yourself a clear pathway, taking away the last hand trap, and then you just play right through it and then you know you gave them a starter, so you're just gonna be able to stop all the plays they have because there's no hand traps for them left to play because you're holding their hand trap anyway. That's why you're playing exchange. You play, you share the graveyard, you share the deck more or less, and now you can even share your hand because this is what a tier zero format is like. Anyways, enough about like theory behind the card. It's very fun to actually play at locals. Uh, let's go on to question number two. Scenario number two. Okay, we're stepping it up now. It's gonna be a bit more challenging. Now we're going to a mid game scenario before the judge gets called here. And in the back row, there is Mirror Jade, the Ice Blade Dragon, that was pushed by a Snake Eyes Flamberge Dragon. And so somehow the Flamberge player, the Snake Eye player, was not able to take game after you know having such a successful turn, but ends up passing turn back to the branded player. All right. So the branded player here now was really happy because he flipped over a copy of Branded Fusion, proceed to do the fusion line with the Albaz and whatnot, get to the Albion. Albion attempts to fuse into a Mirror Jade Ice Blade Dragon again, and then tries to push for lethal. However, player B, the Snake Eye player, is like, hey, wait a second, you can't summon the Ice Blade Dragon. You can only control one copy. Player A is like, well, this doesn't count because I don't have an Ice Blade Dragon on the field. That's not a monster, so it doesn't count. And so they call a judge, 
and this is where you step in. What is the ruling towards the Mirror Jade Ice Blade Dragon in the back row? You guys have five seconds to answer this. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Sorry, branded players, but that summoning of Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon that is an illegal summon because you already control a Mirror Jade. That phase sub continuous spell card called Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon that was pushed there, that still counts towards a card you control as Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon. It's not looking for a monster of Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon, it is looking for that exact name. And while that card is still face up in your back row, it's not a blank card, it's not a token or anything. It actually carries the name of Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon, and therefore you control it, and you can't summon out Mirror, Mirror Jade. It's functioning much like its own floodgate, preventing you from summoning another copy. Yeah, that's probably the best way of putting it, and it does make life a lot safer against, you know, non-targeting banishing effects. Which is fair, it is one of the points of why you would push this card into the back row pretty early on, if you do need to grind out the game. And... This whole thing is more or less about the concept of control. So to kind of give you the big picture here, anything on your side of the field is considered cards that you control. Whether it be face up or face down, you technically control these face down cards. You control all the face up cards. And to kind of simplify the concept, like yes, you can control spells and traps because just look at a card that's in the current meta right now, Snake Eyes Ash. You can send two face up cards you control to the graveyard, including this card, special summon one snake eye monster from your hand or deck. Does that make sense? So you're sending your continuous spells that are acting as monsters, or maybe even the field spell that you're currently controlling. Yes, control does not apply to monsters, it just applies to the entire side of the field. And so Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon is looking for that exact name. If it's in the back row, it still carries that name, so you still technically control that particular named card. And to kind of give you a further example, because some people are still playing Rescue Ace, for instance. Okay, so Rescue Ace, if you manage to push a Hydrant, a Rescue Ace Hydrant, into the back row, when you activate your cards like Extinguish, Alert, and like Contain, all of them will be able to get their secondary effects off. So Alerts will now basically function as a quick play Rota for Rescue Ace cards. Uh, and then uh, if you use Extinguish, you're still able to like get the, uh, I guess the Call by the Grave-esque effect where you shut off that entire card name uh, for the turn. That still applies. Now, I want to kind of clarify something though. Let's use Extinguish as the example. If you control a Rescue Ace monster, target one effect monster your opponent controls, destroy it. Then if you currently control a Rescue Ace Hydrant, your opponent cannot activate the effects of that destroyed monster or monsters with the same name, original name, this turn. So that particular effect will still technically apply. However, if you don't control a Rescue Ace monster, you will not be able to activate Extinguish even if you have a Hydrant in the back because that Hydrant right now is functioning as a continuous spell card. It is not a monster. You do not control a Rescue Ace monster. And so that's why you would not be able to activate Extinguish in that manner. However, if you have any Rescue Ace monster, whether it be Impulse, Airlifter, Preventer, Turbulence, any monster on the field, and you have the Hydrant in the back row, then you'll be able to get the secondary effect of all those cards, which is actually kind of nice, especially for cards that don't require the monster like Alert or Rescue. They start to become like OP cards. And remember cards like Extinguish, they're not once per turn. If they're really cheesy and they push like a Rescue Ace Hydrant into the back, or they choose to push it to the back with a Poplar just so that they can mess with you and play multiple Extinguishes, you know, that's completely up to them. And then, you know, you're in for a really, really rough time. Uh, that is actually some cheese tech that uh, I kind of want to try out, but I'm not sure if it's going to be that functional. But that is a possibility, and I have seen this happen time and time again, uh, where people kind of argue, like, hey, Rescue Ace Hydrant, do I get the secondary effect? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do get the secondary effect, because when it's looking for Rescue Ace Hydrant, it's not looking for a Rescue Ace monster, it's just looking for that particular name, and in the back row, it still counts.
Question number three, this is a little bit more complicated because this one's related to U-Bell. And trust me, there's gonna be a lot more U-Bell rulings probably in the future because people are gonna care about it once Legacy of Destruction drops and that becomes a lot more popular as a deck and also probably a ban list. But anyways, in this particular scenario, we have the opponent, which is playing Skull Guardian, Voiceless Voice, and the low, they've set up their board. However, on the U-Bell player side, there's currently a U-Bell on the field, okay? And there is also Nightmare Pain, plus a more, I guess, questionable card. There is also Zero Zarok. So the card in question here is Zero Zarok. Your opponent cannot target face-up attack position monsters with zero attack for attacks. Okay, so this one prevents the U-Bell monsters from being targeted for attacks. However, Nightmare Pain, on the other hand, while you control a U-Bell monster, you must attack the U-Bell monster, okay? So now you have two things in conflict. One thing that you can't target it for attack and the other thing you must attack. Because these two cards are in conflict, one, well, essentially, if you control attack position monster, you'll be forced to enter the battle phase, all right? Because you must attack it. That doesn't get stopped because the other one says you can't. You have, because you control the zero attack monster, therefore, you have to go into battle phase as long as you control attack position monster. So that monster is able to attack, so it's going to go into battle phase. However, once you get into battle phase, you start to notice, like, hey, I can't target that monster for attack. What is this particular scenario? Is it A, an infinite loop where it forces people to be locked into the battle phase, or B, there is a card that takes priority, uh, which is, you know, the one that doesn't allow for the attack, so therefore you can go into the battle phase and you can just end the battle phase because you cannot declare the attack. Or is it C, something else where, hey, you have to attack the monster anyway, or D, and the legal card was activated because it caused an infinite loop, so zero is a rock. Whatever that's causing the infinite loop has to be sent away. What is your answer? You have five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. If you said that this is an infinite loop, you would be incorrect. This is actually not an infinite loop. In fact, there's actually precedent to this case even before you bell. And that's actually related to the Labyrinth cards, okay? So, if you guys answer that, hey, Nightmare Pain overrides the Zero Zorok, then you are correct. That's right. If you cannot target your opponent's face-up monster zero attack <laughs> for attack, but then you must attack it, the wording of you must attack a U-Bell monster supersedes the one where you cannot target that monster for attack. So, in other words, Zero Zorok right now is currently not in effect. That's right. It's not in effect right now while the Nightmare Pain is still live. You'll still try to apply it as much as possible because technically both effects are still live, but at the end of the day, the Nightmare Pain supersedes it and you will still be forced into attacking it. So if you're playing as that voiceless voice player, prepare to take a ton of damage as you argue why you can't attack, but yeah, you still have to attack even if Zero Zorok is on the field. Where does this ruling stem from? The reference for this is pretty obscure. It's related to Puppet Rook and Labyrinth Archfiend, two of which don't really work together, but according to the database, if they control a Puppet Rook, which is treated as a fiend, let's go with DNA surgery by card effect, and a Labyrinth Archfiend on the field, how can my opponent's monster attack? That was the question, and this is actually within database. So what do these cards even do? So Puppet Rook has a line which states that your opponent's monsters uh, must attack this card. And then we have Labyrinth Archfiend, which has this particular card text, which states that uh, your opponent cannot target fiend monsters for attacks except for Labyrinth Archfiend. So you have the same scenario of cannot target for attacks and must attack. So you have these two things going on at the same time. So what is the solution in this particular case? Well, probably the answer is your opponent must attack the Puppet Rogue due to its effect. So must attack supersedes cannot target for attack. And that's the precedent that this particular case sets up. It's really weird considering these cards are like super like unrelated, but at least it sets a precedence for the U-Bell cards that we are currently playing. And so if in the future someone decides to cheese with it, I mean, zero Zarag, I mean, keeping a U-Bell monster alive, I don't know if it's like feasible, but at least we know that one, this does not set up an infinite loop and two, there is an out to the solution. Yet, okay, so I do know that this one is a bit trickier because most of the time, whenever 
you know you're given the choice where it would do something different versus cannot do something cannot do something normally would kind of take place so we're talking about like imperial iron wall versus like d shifter or lancia versus d shifter you know the thing that prevents your game state from changing usually takes place uh however this particular case is not one of those cases you must attack will supersede the thing that you cannot attack that's all I got for this one, but did you manage to guess which one of these questions applied to our Nishi? That's right, he's the person that got screwed over, but which one of these really did he get screwed over by? The answer is number two. He got screwed over by double Mirror Jade. There were two Mirror Jades on the field. Uh, he would have won the game. However, a second Mirror Jade appeared, banished his Flamberge, I believe, and it actually cost him the game. And whatever it may be, he didn't know at the time. And technically, our other buddy almost got messed over by the rescue ace hydrant things like can i actually get the second effect the hydrant he asked in the chat i'm like yeah you can the name is still technically on there so name pushing has definitely pushed two concepts for us to know one stuff in your control still carries this name even if it's a monster pushed to the back row the name is still there and cards you control are everything on your side of the field and the second concept is if you must attack versus you cannot target things for attack. Must attack will take precedent over it. You can ask most judges about this, but of course, at the end of the day, everything is decided by your head judge, so ask your head judge, but this one's kind of a, a no-brainer now because most people have the reference, they have the resources. That's all I got for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, smash that thumbs up button. If you guys want to see more stuff from MST.TV, hit subscribe, ding that notification bell, check out mstmerch.com. If you guys want to help support this channel, get yourself some goodies, some essentials, you know, play mats, whether it be over sleeves, sleeves, foil sleeves, anything to make your collection more organized and neat. MST merch got you covered. And I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks for watching.